Hey there YouTube, Far North Racing here. So what we've got today is the block out of the Stealth. And before we send it off to the machine shop, we have to do a few checks to it. The machine shop is going to hot tank it, which cleans off all the crud you see here. They're going to magnaflex it, which checks the casting for cracks. And they're going to deck the surface. They're going to take a mill and just plane the surface off to make sure that it's nice and clean and flat. What we're going to have to know is the condition of the bores here, and we have to know the condition of the main journals underneath. We have to see if the diameter is right. We have to see if it's out of round, so if it's egg-shaped, the diameter is the same in this direction as it is in this direction. We have to check it for taper, where the diameter at the top of the cylinder is the same as the diameter at the bottom of the cylinder. And the reason why we have to check this is the factory shop manual as specifications for all these dimensions. And if we're out of spec, it means we have to do machining to correct it. And if we have to machine the block because we're taking metal away, that influences decisions on piston selection and bearing selection and a number of other things. So what we have to do is take these measurements. These measurements require a very high degree of precision. That requires its own special measuring tools. And what we're going to show you today is we're going to show you how to use those special measuring tools to check the bore diameter, out of round taper, the crankshaft diameter on all its journals, and the bearing clearance on the main journals. Let's get started. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, you've probably seen me use this caliper here whenever I'm making something on the lathe or the mill. This is a digital caliper. Works very simply. As you move the thing back and forth, you can measure in between the jaws, and it reads the size of the uh, item you're measuring directly. Very, very convenient, reasonably accurate, and it reads up to three decimal places, so thousands of an inch. On this final decimal point, you'll see it'll skip between zero and five, like that. So it'll, it'll give you an indication on whether or not it's halfway between any two given thousands, uh, but you can't read thousands of an inch directly. All you get is the... Uh, first digits in here. Very handy piece of kit. Does metric conversion for you. You just have to push that. You can go there for fractions. You can go there for metric. This is one of the workhorse tools I've used over the last few years. Uh, it's great for doing reverse engineering for CAD. It's a, a quick and easy way to get measurements. Unfortunately, nowhere near accurate enough for what we're doing here. So here we have the factory shop manual, which is an absolute must own if you're going to do any sort of work on a vehicle. The sort of Chilton repair or Auto repair for dummies kind of stuff doesn't cut it. And if we open it up here to the specifications for the engine, you can see here cylinder block bore is given as 91.1 millimeters or 3.5866 inches. And the tolerance for out of round and taper is less than 0 0.02 millimeters, which is 0 0.0008 inches. So if we wanted to try and use a digital caliper here to measure that, this only measures in thousands of an inch. So we can't even get to see the 10 thousandths that this thing needs. This is the kind of specification that you're dealing with. You need the ability to be able to read in 10 thousandths of an inch. And that's going to require more specialized equipment than just our caliper. Now, there's a number of different tools you can use to measure inside diameters. You can use things like inside micrometers, which read it off directly. It's a micrometer that expands to fit a bore. You can also use something called a telescoping snap gauge, which expands inside the bore, and then you measure the outside of it using your micrometer. Those have their uses, but if you really want to get it right, you use one of these. This is a dialed bore gauge. The way this works is on this end, you have a standard plunger dial indicator and it clamps into this fixture and inside is a, a rod and there's a right angle attachment inside here and you can see this little plunger when you see when you press in on the plunger it moves a needle and you see how much it moves that's because this reads in ten thousandths of an inch directly on this side you have an anvil the set comes with a, a series of different lengths to get you in the ballpark for what you want to measure. Then this gets inserted into the bore, it presses on the plunger, these two little wheels center it in the bore, and then you rock it back and forth 
until the plunger reads the minimum reading, and that's the diameter you're looking at. There are a couple of tricks with this. These things are normally very expensive. It's easy to spend $1,000 on one of these if you get a really good one. This one here is a China import uh, brought in by a company called uh, AccuSize, where I've used some of their cutting tools in the past. I, I kind of was hoping it was specific to them, but no, it's the same Chinese one that all the Chinese importers bring in. Not a bad piece of kit, made to a reasonable fit and finish, and seems to do the job. Uh, the big sort of weird herald on it, though, is that because they've used an off-the-shelf dial indicator, dial indicator is when you push on the plunger, the needle goes up. With a bore, though, as the plunger goes out, the bore is getting larger. So you want the, the dial indicator to read backwards for normal, and this one doesn't. A, a perfect one actually has zero and then 10, 10, 20, 20, 30, 30, so you get differentiation on either side of the set point, which we'll get to in a minute. This one here just reads the numbers. So as part of the cost savings that comes along with buying the Chinese part, you do have to do a little bit of mental math to understand that this isn't nine, this is actually, uh, in this case, it's reading about eight, uh, eight ten thousandths. You gotta go back around the direction. Small price to pay for saving $900. Now the key to one of these things is that it's not a direct reading instrument. By which I mean, if you take the caliper, like this, take the caliper, set it to zero, and you want to measure something, put it on there, pull it off, and you can see that, that diameter of that shaft is half an inch. You read that directly. There's never any question about whether that's half an inch or not so long as the zero is set properly. This, like all other dial indicators, doesn't work that way. This is a comparing tool. So what you have to do is first set it to a known diameter, and then the plunger will read the change from what you set it to. So there's two parts to this. The first is you set it to the diameter that you're trying to compare, and the second part is the actual use of the tool to read off the change. In this case, what we want to do is measure the bores. The bores are supposed to be 91.1 millimeters. So what we're going to do is set a micrometer to exactly that diameter, zero this out inside the micrometer, and then use this to measure the bores inside the engine. Let's give it a shot. So what we have here is a three inch to four inch micrometer that's been clamped in the vise. And we've gone ahead and set the diameter of the micrometer to be the diameter of the bore that we want to measure, which is in this case is the piston bore. So the specification for the bore is 3.5866. So you can see on the micrometer, we've got 57511, which gets us to 3.586. And because this is a micrometer that reads in ten thousandths of an inch, it has the vernier across the top, and this one here is lined up. So we're at 3.5866. What we have to do now is insert the dial bore gauge indicator in between the micrometer and set it to zero. To help make that a little easier, I've got a piece of just an ordinary soda straw. I'm going to slip that over. That'll capture the anvil of the dial bore gauge indicator when it comes in like this, and it keeps it from falling off the end of the micrometer, just to make it a little easier to get it done. You kind of need three hands to do the setup on this. So what you do is you just insert the anvil in there, push down on that, so now the plunger is in between, and now you just rock it around, but you got to keep it on there, this is why that piece of straw is there. You rock it around looking for the minimum number on the dial, and then once you think you got it, twist the dial down, and you keep going like this back and forth until you got it set. That takes a couple of seconds, so uh, I'll just go ahead and set this, and I'll show you afterwards how it looks. So now that we have the dial zeroed, we just take this, we insert it into the bore, and catch it on the anvil, just like that. And you hold the plunger in the place where you want it to measure, and then you just rock it back and forth like this, watching the indicator to see where its minimum value is. And that minimum value is the shortest distance across from the plunger and the anvil. And that tells you the difference 
in size between the bore that you set on your micrometer and the bore that you're measuring here. So we'll just insert the tool into the bore. We give it a wiggle. And that point right there, because that's where the needle reverses direction as we move it back and forth, that represents the minimum diameter across the bore there. And that is six ten thousandths of an inch because we have to count backwards from zero. So that tells us that at that specific point, the bore is six ten thousandths of an inch larger than what we set on the micrometer. That's how this works. Very, very useful tool. Very easy to use once you get the hang of it. What we'll do is we'll take points at various spots in the bore. So here we push it down a little bit larger. And there you can see it's just about five ten thousandths of an inch. And if we go up a little higher, there it's about seven ten thousandths of an inch. That lets us measure the taper in the bores. So to measure the crankshaft journal diameter, we don't need any jiggery pokery with anything special. All we need is a good old fashioned micrometer. Now, unfortunately for me though, my micrometers in this size don't have the verniers on the top to let you read in ten thousandths. It's got a half way mark in between the individual thousandths so I can tell if it's more or less than half a thousandth. But I can't read off the number exactly and the specification for out of round on the crank is point zero 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 one two. Not good enough. So you might think we're euchred as far as measuring bearing clearance is concerned, but we've got a trick. This micrometer is set to the proper distance across this journal. And even if I don't know exactly what this number is, I can set the dial bore gauge to this distance and then measure the delta on the bearing. And that will tell me clearance. So even though I don't know the diameter of the, of the journal to the specification well enough to be able to tell if the crank's okay, I'm gonna have to get a better micrometer. I can at least check the bearing clearance and see how the engine was doing with the old bearings. Let's have a look at that. So here we've got that micrometer, which is set up to be the same distance across here as the number one crank journal. We'll just take our dial bore gauge with a different anvil in it. And we'll set it up to be zeroed. All right, we're good. So what we've done here is we've reinstalled the main journal girdle with the bearings still inside it. These are the original bearings that came out of the motor when we first assembled it. We've torqued down all the mounting bolts to 54 foot-pounds per the shop manual, and we've gone ahead and reset our dial bore gauge to fit the gauge to, to match the diameter of the number one crank journal, which is this one right here. So what we're gonna do now is just insert this in here. Gotta watch out for the oil groove. There. And I can now rock back and forth and measure it. And we, at that point, we've got a clearance of 28 ten thousandths. And I can rotate that around in here. Again, watch out for the oil hole. Put it in. Pull it around. And right there, that's 31 ten thousandths. Specification for the clearance here is between 8 and 14 ten thousandths. So the bearing clearance here is roughly double what it's supposed to be. And that may be an indicator of what was going on with this motor. The oil clearance is a little bit too loose. I'm going to go and order myself a better micrometer so I can properly measure the crank journals. But you can see that by setting this to match the front crank journal, we can now measure this bore here and get the differential on here so we can tell whether or not that was any good or not. I'll go through and do that for the rest of the motor, which I won't bother putting on the video because that's kind of boring. And uh, then we'll go have a look at the numbers once we're finished and see what we can find. So what we have here is an Excel spreadsheet that I've used to record all the data that we took off the block using the dial bore gauge. Each one of these blue circles represents one of the bores. 
So here we see values that were recorded in parallel with the crank, and here we see values that were recorded at right angles to the crank. So anything measured this way is recorded here, anything measured this way is recorded here. And what that allows us to do is take the bore value up here, calculate the bore based off the delta we got off the dial bore gauge, and then we can also do some magic on it thanks to Excel, where we both look at taper in the X and the Y, and the max out of round for the whole bore, and throw some conditional formatting on it as well. So anything that's in spec is green, anything that's out of spec is red. And what we see is that we're in spec for taper, but just barely. We're cutting it pretty close here. The spec is 0 .0008. So here's a 7. However, out of round, it's the same spec. It's 8 ten thousandths, and the best one we've got down here is 10 ten thousandths, and we've got one over here that's 21 ten thousandths. So we know that the bores are out of round, and it's not surprising to see that there's more wear in the thrust direction of the piston than there is in the non-thrust direction. So what this tells us is that at the very least we're going to have to hone the block to bring everything back to round, and depending on how much it's going to take to hone that off, we may want to go and bore it oversized and put in an oversized piston, which is probably what I'm going to do. Otherwise, the piston to wall clearance is too large, it's too sloppy, and you get too much blow by. So it's looking like the plan is to buy a set of oversized pistons, have the block bored to match the oversized pistons, and honed with a torque plate to bring it all nice and, and round when it's all bolted together. I don't have a spreadsheet that shows the bearing clearances that I measured. Those were 24 ten thousandths on the low end to about 37 ten thousandths on the high end, quite a bit outside of the nominal spec, but there's actually a service spec in the manual that says that if it's anything under 40 ten thousandths, it's supposed to be good. So I don't like that. Those clearances are starting to really open up. That means a lot of oil was blowing out the sides of the bearings, and that means we were getting lower oil pressure than we should have been which may be why we saw some of that scoring on those bearings. So the plan is, is to get a proper micrometer, measure the crank out properly, then set it off to be polished, and then have a look at that and see if we can use standard diameter bearings or if we have to go ahead and, and get oversized ones, which I think we may have to do. There you go. That shows how to use a dial bore gauge to generate these kinds of numbers that you need to be able to do when planning your engine rebuild. That's it. Thanks for watching. Now